Okay. Yeah. So next we will move on to our um, uh, 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 roundtable discussion uh, with the industry perspective because obviously the industry folks are the guys actually uh, uh, developing the drugs and so having their uh, perspective is, uh, is quite important. Uh, I will be stepping down from the stage during this period to make sure there's enough room, uh, but uh, uh, Harry will be handling the, uh, the onstage uh, um, uh, duties quite adequately. So. Okay, thank you very much. There's enough room so you could stay as well, but, uh, cause, yeah. but uh, whatever you like. Okay, well, I'll yeah. stay because there's enough room. So, um, um, welcome, uh, gentlemen. No, there's no diversity yet in uh, dr drug development, but it will come <laughs> one day. Um, so, um, here on the podium, we have uh, Doc Myers from Antios and uh, Che Lin from Aligos. And virtually, we have uh, Oliver Lenz from Janssen, um, who is uh, joining us, Bill Delaney from Assembly, and Mike Sofia from uh, Arbutus, so um, drug developers from uh, across the globe. So welcome, everyone. <clears throat> so you've heard the discussions. And um, I think before we start um, asking questions and, 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 and and, and posing problems to you guys. It is, uh, I think, it would be interesting that in like two, three minutes, each company could give a pitch of uh, what their favorite combination is. And obviously you're, you're preaching for your own church a bit, but so I, you could do that to a certain extent, but a bit of objectivity would be, uh, would be very nice as well. Um, so maybe I'll start here. Doc, do you want to start off and, and quickly give your perspective on drug development and particularly to focus it more on what type of me uh, mechanisms of action, so uh, target engagement, uh, you think will, uh, will be the future? Sure. So we think that actually the current nuke therapy is giving us a very good path to drug development. When you look at tenofovir and entecovir, about 5 to 7 percent of patients will have S antigen decline over time, and you can stop them and get a functional cure. The other 90%, if you stop therapy within 12 weeks or so, they've all rebounded and relapsed. We interpret this to mean that in five to 7% of patients, the nuke is able to completely shut down replication, allowing the immune system to clear out the infected cells over a period of time, because you don't replenish CCC DNA, and the immune system is trying to clear out the virus. In the other 95% of patients, we believe this represents low levels of ongoing viral replication that replenish CCC DNA, and that's why S antigen is not declining. Based on this, we are developing a drug called ATI 2173. It's a prodrug of clevidine that essentially shuts down all polymerase functions in a non nuke like way. And our strategy is simply to combine a non nuke like nuke that's synergistic to additive with a chain terminating nuke and shut down the polymerase activity that you are not able to shut down in 90% of patients with chronic HPV. By doing this, we think we'll increase the functional cure rate uh, in these patients and we'll see a slow S antigen drop with this type of therapy. If we need additional mechanisms, we particularly like the CAMs because they're also oral and we can put tenofovir, our drug, and a, and a CAM in a, in a convenient once a day oral regimen, but we're keeping an open mind. We're looking at siRNA and other mechanisms. I think from my perspective, we're like we were of HPV in the early 2000s as we get multiple mechanisms emerging. I'm not sure we have the right drugs yet. I think the CAMs going from first to fourth generation is going to be a big difference in their potency. I think the RNA destabilizers are just coming up the pipeline. So we're keeping an open mind as to what the ultimate regimen will look like. We believe that if you shut the virus down, the immune system will clear out the infected cells and you will get a functional cure. All right, thank you very much for uh, staying on time as well. Um, Tselin, would you like to? Yeah. Sure. So I think we have a similar strategy, but uh, in the articles we have a Can you speak topic. into the microphone, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, so in the articles, we have a two platform, two strategy to target <coughs> HPV. I think the first part is easy. We use the oral available drug to really su fully suppress HPV replication, meaning beside the nuclear site, we are developing the next generation CAM, which is sub nanomolar potency. We try to fully suppress HPV DNA and RNA to undetectable 
And we hope, as Hightower said, use the second mode of action with a more potent CAM, we can enhance the CCCDNA pool to reduce it and also impact on the S antigen reduction. So that's the first part. And the second part, the strategy is actually more complicated. So we use an oligonucleotide platform to target the S antigen, or different antigen, especially S antigen. From the preclinical and clinical data, we learn the single reagent unlikely you can suppress S antigen to undetectable. In this case, actually, we're developing three different oligonucleotides to really to target the S antigen. So the first one is so-called STOPS. S antigen transport inhibiting oligonucleotide polymers. So this has very unique mode of action. So it's not direct target the virus, so with evidence, it doesn't buy any antigen, but and it targets the host factor. And it targets three different distinguished mode of action. It's targeted on the viral transcription, on the SRF1, and it's targeted on the transcription elongation, translation elongation, sorry, uh, RPLP1, RPLP2, and it's also targeted on the protein folding, the chaperone, GRP78. So we have strong evidence, and by doing this, give the STOPS molecule, enhance the ubiquinone on S antigen, and degrade S antigen in the cells. And the second uh, oligonucleotide we're using is uh, the ASO. I think you are very familiar with it. What we do is uh, we are using the uh, GANEC to target not only the liver, but we have evidence it's go to the hepatocyte. So that's very important. And also, we are using the new chemistry, so-called BNA, bridging nucleic acid, to improve not the potency, but more important, to improve the safety margin. So we can dose more frequent, and also use the loading dose to increase the potency and give long time to the patient. The third but not least, the SIRNA. I think it's very similar to the other company are doing there. So we use organic uh, technology to target hepatocyte to increase the potency and the safety. So long story short, uh, we believe combination of stage one, fully suppressed on the viral replication, and on stage two, to really move away all the S antigen, and then we can achieve the functional cure. The last but not the least, so Adam, we didn't ignore you, so we do recognize immune moderator is very important. But as a drug developer, we think of safety first. So currently, we only feel comfortable to use interferon in our combination strategy. But uh, we were open-minded once we see the other molecule, like the body vaccine, or the PD-1, PD-1 antibody small molecule. If that's safe, for sure, we will include in our future combination strategy. OK, thank you very much. Um, Oliver Lenz, Jansen, can you give? I think you're muted, Oliver. Very good. I'm muted. Yeah, Thank, you. Very... <laughs> Thank you for reminding me that I'm muted. Thank you for inviting me <laughs> and giving me the opportunity to give a perspective from, from the Janssen side of things. So, so yes, we are aiming for combination regimens like I think there's com the consensus here in the room to achieve functional cure, which I think is the aim we have to go for. And we think that a successful combination regimen will likely entail agents blocking viral replication and ideally reducing CCC DNA levels for transcription activity. But importantly, you need to reduce antigen load. And here, I think HPS antigen, which is, um, seems to be the main immune suppressive HPV protein, would be key. And to achieve that, uh, as IRNA, looks like a very promising approach because it knocks down all viral antigen with generally a more potent activity on HPS antigen than the other antigens. And this in combination with a nuke and possibly other direct antivirals such as CAM uh, could be promising. We're currently conducting studies to assess the potential of these direct antiviral agents for HPV. However, we, we recognize the importance of long-term immune control for achieving functional cure. And while these direct antivirals may lead to an indirect recovery of immune function, 
we expect that a direct activation of the immune system, especially CD8 T cells, will be required for high efficacy. Uh, we also started combination studies with, with interferon to, as a first step into the, some immune activation uh, studies with immune activation agents. But we're also exploring or looking forward uh, towards more um, wider approach in immune modulating agents, ultimately going for combinations through a particular vaccine or the T cell activating or inducing agents which we think are really needed to achieve higher um, or high rates of functional cure. I would briefly like to take the opportunity to go a bit beyond what is the best regimen. I try to be brief, but I wanted to add two points for consideration from a clinic company perspective for clinical studies related to the preclinical and clinical development. Um, we have heard today and we have seen great progress in HPV re research. Um, however, it still remains challenging to use preclinical models to select a regimen, since all the in vitro tools and animal models have limitations and only poorly reflect the complexity of the disease in humans. And in addition, the usefulness of these models to guide combination regimens is still unclear, to say the least. And then also the clinical development comes with quite some challenges, and we've heard some of them about the diversity of population, which population to include, how much data you need with a single agent before combinations to be tested, and then the spacing of the treatment. Adam was making a point that sometimes sequential treatment is better than combination, and how long treatment should be done. Then we have this whole range of biomarkers, which Massimo nicely introduced, and Let, there let's, more. Let's focus, because I want to give the companies roughly the same amount of time. So. We'll, we'll get back I'll to those questions because uh, I, I prepared a few questions uh, on that, uh, okay. Oliver, as well. Yeah? Okay, thank okay. you very much. My point already. I was done. Yeah, all right. Um, Mike, Mike, Sophia, Arbutus. You're also muted, I think, Mike. Thanks. Um, our strategy for quite a while now has been um, really the combination therapy approach, really suppress, reduce, and boost. Um, so suppress viral replication uh, completely uh, to eliminate any leakage that is associated with, with nucleoside uh, analogs. Um, in addition, you know, to try to reduce the, the pool of CCC DNA uh, reduce the amount of S antigen that produced um, as a result of, of the belief that S antigen plays an important role in the whole uh, immune exhaustion uh, phenotype that's observed with HPV, and then boost the immune system um, either by simply reducing S antigen or by introducing an immune modulatory strategy. So, you know, we've been developing a number of agents uh, to deliver on this strategy. One, obviously, is a capsid assembly inhibitor uh, to allow us to completely shut down viral replication and reduce that, that pull of CCC DNA. The other is the S antigen um, uh, reducing agent, uh, either our siRNA, which is uh, AB729, which is now in phase two clinical development, uh, to reduce S antigen, but also actually have, yeah, because it uh, knocks down all viral transcripts, has an effect on HBX, and also HBV DNA production. And then uh, the idea of ultimately uh, uh, trying to uh, elicit a preferable immune response, we, we really focused a lot of our internal efforts on developing a checkpoint blockade agent, specifically a small molecule agent that we believe because it's liver centricity will allow us to have reduced side effects associated with uh, typical antibodies associated with uh, checkpoint blockade. Um, so our strategy sort of is is this three-pronged approach that we believe, and I think, you know, based on all the discussions that you've seen here at this meeting, um, is a strategy that that is more and more becoming uh, accepted as, as a viable approach. In addition, you know, we are looking at a number of combinations, uh, uh, clinical collaboration combinations that will help help define the field in a way, uh, specifically around uh, AB729 being the backbone of that kind of combination where we're working with a number of other companies 
with novel uh, agents that, that uh, also suppress uh, HPV DNA replication more completely or immune modulation within a, a therapeutic vaccine. Okay. So overall, you know, uh, I think we're, we're executing on a strategy that does uh, uh, focus on combination therapies with looking at these three critical areas that we think are important. Okay. And I think that the field believes uh, is going to be necessary for achieving an ultimate functional cure. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, Bill? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Harry. So, uh, briefly, Assembly Biosciences has been advancing a portfolio of core inhibitors of increasing potency. Um, that's been our primary focus to date. Um, and and the, the strategy, really, the, the first goal is to max out antiviral therapy. It was mentioned by Mora and others at this conference that there's, there's clearly still evidence of HPV replication while patients are on nukes, even if they're suppressed at very low levels, we're, we're, not, we're not looking in the liver and the replenishment of CCC DNA is like, likely ongoing, going to be a barrier to sterilizing cure or, or just makes a higher hurdle for uh, immune mediated cure as well as the virus is still spreading and replenishing. So we've got a lead molecule of Corvair that's in, in phase two studies, uh, demonstrated safety in, in about 100 patients to date in, in phase two studies. Um, and will, has shown it, um, you know, enhanced antiviral efficacy on, on top of uh, nucleoside analogs. Uh, and we have two additional compounds, uh, one in phase one and, and one that we've just nominated and is in the IND enabling studies. And, you know, I think the capsid inhibitor, core inhibitor field has moved forward light years in terms of potency, and, you know, now being able to drive down to single digit nanomolar activity, not only against the, um, the antiviral mechanism, but also against the CCC DNA formation mechanism. It'll be very exciting to get those new compounds into clinical studies and see if they can go beyond what current uh, first generation core inhibitors have been able to do. So our, our first part of our strategy is to improve the potency and max out um, the antiviral component in combination with nucleoside. Uh, secondly, we're looking at combinations, um, the topic here. Uh, you know, our initial um, uh, foray into taking patients that have been treated with, with nuke and capsid inhibitors, um, you know, showed relapse in patients. Um, so uh, it's obvious, at least with first generation agents, you're going to need additional mechanisms. Um, so we have two phase two studies ongoing with Bevacorvir and nuke. One is the study that Mike alluded to, which is in combination with uh, the Arbutus siRNA 729. And then we're also doing a study with interferon. And then I think novel targets are uh, still needed in this field. Uh, it's a really exciting time across the field. We're seeing a lot of new agents, and Adam summarized a lot of the immune agents very nicely in the first presentation. Uh, we've seen some initial data with uh, Core and Nuke from, from our company and from others, but you know we're still looking for a, a significant breakthrough in, in terms of, of cure rate. Uh, in fact, I, I haven't seen anything yet that's really getting us beyond what we were able to achieve with interferon plus nucleoside. So I, um, we're expanding our, our, our research portfolio of assemblies too, and look, looking at some new targets that I'll be excited to talk about in the future. So, um, you know, I, I think this uh, overall agreement with uh, my, my colleagues across the industry that we want to look at, you know, in increasing antiviral suppression, and we want to look at combinations, you know, phase two studies with combinations of multiple agents, um, which will be done within companies and between companies. So, exciting time. Okay, thank you very much. So it's. Uh Antioles and assembly are mainly targeting the virus, obviously, and, and hopefully with that we will also invoke an immune response to be effective. The other companies are also, well, everyone's looking at immune modifiers at the end of the day, and uh, uh, which might be interfering in, in, in the near future because we know the drug and it's been around for a long time and it might have side effects, but short term we could give it. And then Arbutus is also actively in, uh, investing in a checkpoint inhibitor, and then obviously the portfolio of the, drug, of the different companies um, varies here and there. So I, w I would like to go to, because th there's a reason I think the questions that were brought to the audience uh, were brought, because they're important, right? So to what extent do the companies use uh, withdrawal as of nucleus, nucleoside analog treatment as an therapeutic option or, or not. So in other words, are you really targeting to get the patient's S antigen negative on treatment, which would be ideal, or do you actively uh, start withdrawing nukes, 
potentially in patients that you pre-treat with siRNAs to, to get them a low S level, below 100, for instance. What, what is your take on that? What, because what, it's a very delicate balance, uh, obviously, there's, it's not without risk to, <clears throat> to discontinue treatment or to discontinue nukes. So I would like to know whether you're using um, nuke withdrawal as a therapeutic option in your regimens. There's silence, everyone can speak. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. Certainly, we're all interested, I think, in ultimate withdrawing therapy of all type and seeing what happens. Um, it is a challenge, right? I think, I think regulators, as we design these clinical trials and get regulatory approval, um, there, there is a regulatory uh, input into whether you're able to do that or not. And uh, I think, you know, clearly, we want to reduce S antigen to a, a certain level. Um, uh, what that level is, is, is certainly debatable. Less than 100 international units, I think, is one that, that is generally uh, viewed as acceptable. And so, uh, and then how long do you keep patients on nukes after that uh, to then be competent enough that you have a sustained S antigen suppression and HPV DNA suppression that you can then re remove the nucleoside and see what happens. Uh, and I think this is a this is a, a discussion that you know we've had with regulators. I'm sure other colleagues have had with regulators on on what is the appropriate time and under what appropriate conditions and uh, patient conditions that you're able to do that. But but certainly we we do want to do that. Any other comments? Here, Doug, that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is a challenging area because we only really have the nuke paradigm uh, to go off of, which is when S antigen gets low, the functional cures are, are, are reasonably frequent. Uh, I think, you know, at this point our strategy has been to stop. We're only treating for one or three months, so the risk of a f severe flare is low. We're staying in uh, F2 or better uh, liver fibrosis stays patients. And we're tracking them very, very carefully with frequent follow-up and restarting if they have any evidence that they've had a significant rebound. Luckily, to date, we've not had the flares in our program. But I think at this point, we're going to have to stop patients to figure out the rules to successfully get functional cures in the clinic. And because if we don't stop them, we won't be able to get the data that tells us how to safely stop them. And so I think um, it's it's a... It's a risk, uh, it's, it's very challenging, but at this point, we know that the end point is the, the regulators want DNA negative to stay negative and S antigen clearance if possible, but we don't have any agreement on how to get there, and I think we're gonna have to get clinical data that tells us what the right stopping rules are for these programs, and they may be different between our different combinations of regimens, and we can only find that out with with clinical studies. So you would stop even if the patient is as positive, uh, that's what you're saying? At this point we are. Uh, yeah. As I said, we're following them two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, very frequently and restarting very promptly if they have evidence of, of relapse. Okay. <coughs> Go ahead. So, yeah. yeah um, I think the goal for the HPV therapy is functional cure. We want to stop therapy. So in certain stage, we have to start a nuke. And I think this, uh, I agree with Michael, it's a very tricky question. So we are negotiating with authority, how can we stop it? Uh, I think today what we have learned is um, several things. Number one, uh, from based on Taiwan study layer, if a patient achieves the uh, antigen lower than 100 copy, it's a higher chance during the time they will get a functional cure. That's number one. And number two, from different study layer, we learn the antigen kinetic <coughs> plus the ALT flare probably kind of projector, so how the patient can be cured in the future. So we are in learning process which biomarker we can observe and learning use this combination to project the functional cure. So in another word, safety first is always my own word, but we have to find the right way to stop therapy and leading to a functional cure. Okay. Any other comments? I, maybe, I, go I have to, a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Oliver. Yeah, I think all the relevant points have been made. I just want to reiterate one point related to 
it's the point of retreatment. It's which patients do we stop when and which are the schedules of follow-up and what are the rules of retreatment. And there is indeed some variability between the different NUCS stop studies, uh, there is variability in the clinical practice, and I assume there's variability between the trials of the different sponsors. And there has been a discussion at the HPV forum around nuke stop, and there's some interest in the HPV forum, just to make that case here, to sort of provide some framework thinking of what would be a requirement for retreatment, what would be good rules for retreatment, to make sure that the safety of the patients is, is warranted. But in the end, if you want to go for functional cure, we have to take a step at a certain moment to stop treatment. But that should be done in a safe way. All right. I don't have anything else to add. I completely agree. This is, this is the way forward for the field. We have to take patients off. It's, it's a matter of deciding on the exact criteria how to handle patients after uh, if they relapse. But that, I think that, that can all be done very effectively. Yeah. All right, Adam. So it, yeah, Adam, Gary. So I, Gary. I just then would like to challenge each of you. If you want to stop these patients before S is completely gone, are you going to collect the immunological data to actually predict it? Because you're in, you're, you're then assuming that if you're going to stop, that the rest of that clearance is going to happen, probably most likely with immune clearance. So you need to be able to measure that if you want to understand what's actually going to happen in these patients. If we would have good immune, immunological biomarkers, we saw, <laughs> so that, that is the, I mean, I mean well, that was actually they, the question that I asked to the people, right? So they, most of them continued really, yeah, would potentially stop even with low S levels. That's what I, I mean. The, the question is whether we can wait for good immunological markers in the drug development arena, which is so competitive and expensive, right? Well, I mean, the only way you'll get those immunological markers is if you measure those when you stop treatment and find yeah, those yeah. patients that yeah. cure, right? So <laughs> it's a chicken and egg thing. If you don't measure it, you'll never know. Yeah, yeah. Right. You're, you're right. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's, so that's, that's, there's a call for ancillary, uh, ancillary yeah. studies, uh, potentially in Adam's lab. Uh, I, I, would, I would agree. I think that just highlights there is a, there is a clear need for this, and the only way we're going to figure this out is by working collaboratively with, with the experts, with, with you guys, to, to, to monitor the right things moving forward. It, it, should, it yeah. should be done. It's expensive. Um, but, but yeah, if we all agree if we had immune biomarkers that could predict the cure coming, it would be a huge boon for the field. So, Okay. Yeah, let, and we, let, look, we've been doing immune biomarker work for quite a long time now and have, have actually published on, at least presented some work that we've done. Okay. So we, we have a big commitment to gathering the immune biomarkers to try to see if we can uh, predict which patients are responding better to the therapy and, and have the potential for ultimately, you know, removing therapy for, okay. for achieving a functional cure. Okay, Let's all right. So that's, that's good. So you're all working on that. That's, um, so Fabian, you want to chime in? I also would like to ask both you and John, uh, so not a question to the industry, but to the... Uh, uh, world experts, so do you, th you, you can ask your own question, but I, I, for, for the group and for the industry people, I would like to know whether you think that antivirals by itself will do the job or whether we need true immune modifiers. And then uh, and maybe you ask your question first, uh, but I would like to know your op opinion, because we've heard kind of the opinion from the companies, which is also driven by the drugs they have in their portfolio, um, uh, but I, I, I think it would be good to have your opinion as well. I think you're, you're, all, you're also muted, uh, Fabien. I, I had actually a, a comment that was uh, related to that. I mean, we, we uh, obviously the, the field has made a lot of progress. I mean, we have all these assets that are now in, 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 uh, in phase two clinical trials. I mean, and a few years back, I mean, we, we had uh, almost nothing. So, so he, the, the field is progressing and we, we are at the stage where we, we are asking a lot of questions and we, we, the problem is that why, why are we asking those questions? It's because uh, so far we haven't, uh, uh, in our hand, uh, a drug that, or, or a strategy that, uh, uh, that is able to, to achieve HBS loss during therapy. So, so we are, we are, so it's uh, asking whether we can stop at some point based on markers that needs to be defined, uh, uh, or use the uh, the, the stopping 
uh, therapy and the events that occur after stopping to, to help uh, uh, clearing HBS. So, so it's, just, it's really um, uh, um, um, something that is tricky and, and will evolve over time. And, and so just to, to come back to your, to your point, I think we, uh, b before that, I think we, we and I agree with, with Adam, we need to have an assessment uh, of the liver reservoir, both on the viral part and the immune part, uh, whether it's direct assessment or, or uh, by biomarkers that need to be defined, obviously, but uh, this assessment is, very, is, is crucial to, to, to guide the development of, uh, of the different strategies. Now, whether we, we can clear with, with direct acting antivirals, uh, um, we, we are not yet there. Uh, I, I believe we, we can. Uh, if we add uh, stronger, more effective um, mode of actions, uh, but we, we are still to, to work on that. But today, um, uh, the, the only way to 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 see a, a, the, the f a near future is a, is combination with, with immune-based therapies, which doesn't mean that in in a, in a few years we we would be able to 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 do the job with just direct acting antivirals. If one of those companies comes with a, a CCC DNA destabilizer or, or a permanent silencing a, a drug, uh, then that would make the job. Okay. Yeah, so, so my opinion is, is first off, we actually know it is possible to do it. A small fraction of patients do achieve functional cure on Nuke alone, which is obviously a direct acting one. But obviously that is massively uh, insufficient. So we know it's possible but we don't know if those are just a subset of special patients or what. So my personal opinion is that yes, as the drugs get better and better and better and we find out the best combinations, we're going to be able to do it. My question, or, or, or what I why to feel though is there's an additional nuance on there, is that is that the best way to go about it? And that I think no. And it pains me to the core, Adam, to, uh, to admit this in your presence, uh, but I, I really feel that uh, the immune uh, modulators are going to be needed to get this into a short enough and inexpensive enough therapy to be applicable to the large body of, of, of patients who need it in resource-limited countries. Yeah, it's, well, it's, we'll have to see. I, I actually fully agree, if I could, could give an opinion with, with Fabienne, that thus far the antivirals are effective, but we're just not pushing it over the limit, and we, we don't get to S antigen loss. The S level gets very low, but it kind of stays there, and it doesn't seem to be sustained, so we'll have to see whether like a, like a, a wonder a virological drug comes along, and other, otherwise I think there, there would definitely be... Um, uh, room for immune modifying drugs, which are obviously not so easy to use with more heterogeneous response patterns and potential side effects. Um, I wanted to go back also to the endpoint, basically, because we uh, we have these endpoint meetings from the ASLD, ESO, and we uh, and HPS antigen loss is the uh, is the endpoint that we're all um, uh, guiding for, and the and the FDA kind of wants us to do that. But the other question was about whether S loss is not is it not one bridge too far? Is it would it be very difficult to reach? And 26 uh, percent or so, I think, uh, already chose for a partial cure, and it is indeed a very complex disease to cure, where the virus integrates to the host genome, etc. So. What, what are the thoughts, uh, and obviously you're, you're, you're doing your best to, to please what uh, the, the regulators would want currently, um, but would there be a room for, for uh, partial cure? We, we know that the virus, uh, uh, that there is S production from integrated DNA, which uh, might not be very active, so, so uh, or, or not really causing disease. What is your take on that? Yeah, go ahead. No. I think that if you can get a partial cure, you will get a functional cure over time. I think, you know, the issue is if you shut down all viral replication and there is no replenishment of, of the, the CCC DNA, there is integrated a virus that will express S antigen until it's cleared out. So I think a functional cure with decreasing S antigen would be a reasonable endpoint expecting to follow them and see that ultimately they would get a functional cure over time. Okay. Other, other thoughts on this? Because we know that patients with low S levels sometimes 
relapse, right? So that's that, uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I think this is a little complicated. I think our holy grail still functional cure. We really want to show the patient has the best safety when they start therapy, and the, based on the natural history Taiwan did is actually you get functional cure is loss. You have a lower risk for cirrhotic and also HCC. <laughs> I believe this uh, partial cure probably is uh, intermediate. We can accept it, but long term, we should, for a more potent drug, better drug, we should really aim for functional cure to keep the best uh, life quality for the patient. Okay. Any thoughts from the panel oh. online? Yeah. Oliver first, and then uh, Bill. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Partial cure is certainly an intermediate step. Uh, towards functional cure, we might have regimens where we have a certain percentage of patients achieving functional cure and another percentage of patients achieving partial cure. Now, I think one of the main challenges around partial cure is that this is a, seems to be a heterogeneous group of people, at least based on the current standard of care. So patients which are suppressed for some period of time, some ultimately least, uh, lose S antigen, as was pointed out, if S is low, while others relapse. And the challenge I currently see that we don't have very good biomarkers to really predict the long-term outcome of a patient which say six months after end of treatment is in something which we call partial cure because this patient might relapse a year later. On the other hand, this patient might a year later have S antigen loss. So I think that's something for the field to work on to identify new biomarkers which could predict a, st a stable partial cure, stable meaning over many, many years and not a relapse after a few years. No, after. Yeah. Okay, after good point. Years. Bill Delaney? Yeah, I would like to actually offer that I think all, all three of these options, whether it's intensified suppression, partial cure, or functional cure, they would all be advances for the field from where we are now. I mean, we have to remember that still the vast majority of HPV patients are not treated, even though we have very safe drugs, um, you know, this is not a benign virus. We all know that it integrates. This is why we have all this integrated S antigen that we're dealing with. You know, so the virus is constantly inserting into the genome, which I don't think is good for patients. So, you know, I, I think the first goal should be getting all patients undetectable for HPV DNA period. If they have replicating virus, it's detectable. Um, you know, whether that's achieved through a nuke alone or in some patients with a nuke and a core inhibitor, I think whatever it takes to do that. But, but I believe that we have the drugs to, to, to do this and that's achievable. Um, ultimately, we do want to drive for functional cure, um, but it's, it is, it is going to be a, a challenge with as far as we know this. I think we came out of the HCV field with, with, with high hopes after seeing what happened, but, you know, a DNA virus is a very different beast, and, um, you know, the amount of immune dysfunction, you know, that, that may be present in, 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 in patients is, it certainly makes it a challenge. So uh, I, I think these would all be advances for patients. Getting more patients on therapy would, would be great. Um, to prevent long-term, you know, cirrhosis, liver disease, and cancer formation. Um, we ultimately want to drive for the functional cure because that's going to be the easiest thing for patients. But I think any step along the way would be a positive. All right. Just, just one more point. I, I think, look, a lower bar would, I think, be um, uh, acceptable to all, all the commercial people on the, in the group here, right? A lower bar for approval. It's really what what is the, what are regulators going to allow us to do? You know, is is functional cure the only approvable endpoint that regulators are going to uh, approve? And and so we don't know that at this point in time. So what we what we continue to target for is functional cure because we know that that's what the regulatory authorities say is an approvable endpoint, unless that's changed. All right. Any thoughts from Fabien? Any thoughts from the audience? Please stand up if you want and go into the discussion. I, yeah, I, I, I personally would say I agree with, if, if the, the problem with the, with the partial cure is the, is the, is the current non-sustainability and the heterogeneity of that, of that specific group. We really don't know where it would go, and, I, and indeed if we would have better biomarkers to see that these patients remain to be very inactive and eventually cure, I think is definitely the way to go, but we'll, we're kind of bound there. Um, I had one more topic that I wanted. Fabienne, did you want to say something about this as well? Or no? No. No. Okay. okay. So the last, the last topic, or one of the last topics that I wanted to address is the, um, 
should we individualize uh, treatment, right? That comes back in all the discussions that uh, um, we would have the best, the best treatment for the, for, for, the, for the best patient, basically, and uh, it, there's, there's definitely pros and cons to it. It's, it's, it's quite complex. It might not generalize your treatment uh, to, to a large population of patients, but what are the thoughts of, of the companies on that? So, so w w would, it, would it go that way, or uh, c considering the complexity that we currently have and our difficulty, at least from the, from the, with the first wave, to, to get a complete S loss, we're, we're, we're making progress, but it's very slow. So w w what are the thoughts on individualized therapy? So maybe if I can start. Uh I think for drug development, individualized therapy is very difficult. But what we are doing now is really to the different subgroup analysis. So as you mentioned there, there are new suppressed and naive, E positive, E negative. And from there, part, we can learn uh, from four different populations where they can respond in certain therapy in a similar way, so we can provide to them. And uh, from our past experience, the antiviral in general, their response is quite consistent. So I think the only thing we don't know today is about the immune moderator. And this is the part, part is the challenging part, but I think during the phase two trial from different uh, umbrella study, we will learn different population and different treatment duration. How can we lead to layer whether we need individual therapy or not? Okay, Doc? I think individualized therapy is probably, when you're trying to get a drug through the regulators, a step too far, it's just too many variables. I think the, our European colleagues have done a fantastic job once we get a drug to market at individualizing therapy and optimizing it to different patient populations, using the data we generate to start from our, our approvable indications. So I think, at least from my perspective, we're probably going to stick with a fairly simple, you treat X number of months, you get these criteria, you stop. And that, but we fully anticipate that that data would allow others to then move forward to an individualized strategy uh, post-approval. Okay. All right. Um, any other thoughts? If, 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 yeah, Bill? Yeah, I, I would add that I, I think the disease itself is so complex when you look at the natural history of HPV that it's, it's likely we will need therapies for different types of patients. You know, not the ideal situation. We'd rather have one pill that could treat everybody in a defined time. Um, you know, but even for HCV, it didn't start that way. We had different genotypes. We had different lengths of interferon treatment. So I, I think as long as we start to make progress, we'll, we'll figure that out. Um, but I, I, I would strongly suspect that, it, that um, you know, we're going to have to take uh, into account the, the baseline characteristics of the patients when selecting therapies that I wouldn't anticipate that we'll have a universal cure as a first step. Okay. Thank you very much. So are there are questions from the audience, because I, I wanted to do it in two parts, first to structure it a bit, because otherwise there's different panel members and a lot of different questions potentially. Are there any people from the floor who want to ask a question? Massimo Lovrio, you're always very, uh, uh, you have a lot of questions. If not, then I'll just go on with it. Do you have, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I can pretend I'm from the floor right now because, yeah. you know, I'm not a clinician by any means, and so this is useful for me. So uh, we had a patient forum earlier today, and one of the things that was brought out by the patient representatives was uh, the need for affordability. You can have the best drug in the world, but if it doesn't get to the patient, it doesn't do any good. And we all know drug discovery is hideously expensive. So what strategies do your companies see are viable for keeping the cost down enough to be able to be used in the resource-limited countries where there's so many people in dire need? I will step where uh, I fear to tread. Anywhere. Uh, I mean, I think we're going to see the same paradigm as we saw for HIV, uh, for, for hepatitis B, which is going to be tiered pricing. Uh, where you're going to see that the U.S. And, and, and has probably the highest pricing, European countries will have a, a negotiated lower price. And then when you get to countries that are uh, less developed or lower income, you'll see a significant reduction in, in costs, very similar to what we saw or, and are seeing with Hep C and all of our HIV drugs. 
I mean, there are countries in the world where some of our HIV drugs are essentially donated at this point uh, to make access available to those populations. Okay. One, one thing I will say, though, is, look, when, when you're looking at combination therapy, and, and let's say at this, at this stage of the game, if we're looking at an agent to re reduce viral replication, one to reduce S antigen and immune booster, you know, you have three novel, you know, drugs there into, coming into a, a combination therapy. Um, that is not going to be cheap, when, especially you're talking about siRNAs, which is very expensive to, to produce. So, so it's going to be a challenge, the, the pricing side of this, and it would be, frankly, interesting to see how that all pans out. But in, in, in the end, it's better to have a drug that works, that cures people, and, and, than not to have one at all. And, and I think it's, you know, the, the pricing issue is just going to have to be something that's going to need to be addressed over time, and maybe over time, um, uh, as was said, it, it, it will come down, as you see in HCV, over time, you see the competitive marketplace ultimately result in a substantially reduction in the cost of the drug. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike. I, I think the first, we need to get efficacy first. And once we have efficacy, then we can, you know, make the regimens simpler and, and, and cheaper. That, that will happen naturally over time. I think all drug companies know cost of goods is important. Um, complexities, you know, we don't want complexity. We want to make it simple for the patient, simple for the physician simple for manufacturing. So I think that's naturally a pressure that's, that's always there. But we really need to have drugs that work as the first order of business. And, you know, over time, there will be improvements, there will be competition, you know, there will be ways to simplify. But we, we have to learn how to make the breakthrough first. Okay, very good. So I might want to come back, or, yeah, I just want to go on if you, so to, to, the, to the gap between the animals and the, and the, and the in vitro models and the patients, but uh, M Massimo was kind enough to stand up and ask a question, <laughs> go ahead. You provoked me, and so I take the, the challenge. I, in my last slide, I put the, the, the Roman divinity that was uh, with two faces looking at uh, two different directions. And I see this in, 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 in what was been saying uh, from all of you. It's like we hope um, a combination of direct antiviral will be potent enough to stop uh, um, replication uh, deep enough not to have reinfection of new hepatocytes for sufficient time to allow uh, other mechanism to kick in and either silence or uh, by time reduce the pool of the CCCDNA so much that finally it, it gets controlled uh, perhaps with some uh, awakening of immune responses, uh, some uh, signals that will uh, silence the CCCDNA itself, or even degradation just by dilution over time. But finally, uh, this is a good, a good hope. And I said that, uh, that I was really upset that I had to admit that probably the immunologists are right and you have to kick in with some immunomodulation and whatever. Still, I think that uh, the, the pure antiviral uh, approach has the merit to, to be uh, easily manipulated for, for easy therapy and uh, being uh, probably less expensive at the, in the long run. Uh, when you think of a therapeutic vaccine uh, combined with something else, I don't see it so easy to be implemented in, in, in large, 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 large scale. So what is the, the time, this is the question, what is the time that you think is reasonable for a pure antiviral combination uh, to be uh, used in the patients to hope to have this kind of results? Because three months, six months, probably 12 months is not enough. So what is, the, what is your perspective from the industry point of view? How long we, we, yeah. you have to go on with an antiviral therapy, pure antiviral therapy, to, to reach the, the point in which you can hope to stop because you are very near to, yeah. the, to the S loss? Or That's a very clear. Let's, let's start with Mike, because you might all want to ju just give me a number of months, please, and, and with a very short explanation, because otherwise. A number of months. Well, 
I just have to let you look at what happened in HCV, right? It took 16 years from PEG interferon uh, all the way to a one pill once a day for 12 months uh, direct IP antiviral. It's going to take time. Um, and it'll be an evolution. It'll be an evolution over time. And how long that's going to take, I'm, you know, hope it's, it's, it's shorter, uh, than that, but, uh, um, but you wouldn't I, treat for five years with an antiviral, right? I mean, if, no. in, in the drug development, would it be six months, 12 months to start with before no. you well, move on to with an immune modifier? Is it, because it's, well, yeah, difficult yeah, to drug, you know, to, to develop a drug for five years. Sorry, go ahead. The hope is that, I mean, the way we look at it is that you would treat for one, some period of time, maybe six months or so with a direct acting virus to suppress viral replication and the, and the antigen load, and then bring a new new modulatory agent to ultimately kick you, kick the patient over the hump to, okay. to, to broad-based functional cure. Go ahead, yeah. So to our perspective, I think six, 12 months is initially will start for a clinical trial. As I mentioned before, this antigen probably is the key we should suppress. That's why we use a different reagent, different mode of action to target it. So we try to eradicate this antigen as soon as possible. As Massimo said, we'll see how long we need. The host can recover and can control the virus that we will learn. Okay. Other companies? Quickly, Doug? I think, you know, uh, the assembly data shows that the CCC DNA half-life may be shorter than we believe previously, and so I think six to 12 half-lives is a reasonable estimate, and you know, I'm hopeful that that's 12 months uh, and, and not longer, but that's be my belief. Okay. Uh, Oliver, Bill, any numbers? Yeah, I think, I think Go ahead, Oliver. No, no, go ahead. Okay, yeah, six to 12 months, I think, is a reasonable clinical study, and, and then I think we're gonna need to look at biomarkers and you know what we'd like to see with new regimens is that we see maybe some of the other viral biomarkers coming down pre genomic rna correlated antigen or we you know even in the absence of being able to get rid of all surface antigen due to integrants you know i think if we had movement in viral markers then there was a kinetic there that we could see that they were going below the limit of detection you know i think we could learn that in a six-month study and, and and then project forward Oliver, last yeah. word. Yeah, just very briefly. I mean, we are going for a finite treatment, so anything between six and 12 months, I think, should be should be the aim. If that will be sufficient, might depend or will depend on, on the agents we're talking about. If we had a CCC DNA degrading agent, that might go faster. If you have to rely on blocking the replenishment of the CCC, CCC DNA pool, it might be even longer. And even longer might, at a certain moment, not be considered finite sufficiently finite anymore. Okay. I, I had more questions. We, sorry we didn't get to the uh, gap between the animal models and the, uh, and the patients, uh, Oliver. I had uh, questions on flares, etc. cetera, but we're, we're, we don't have time anymore. So I'd really like to thank the panelists for uh, uh, participating here in this discussion. And I, I give the word back to uh, John and Fabien to close the meeting. So Fabian is uh, planning on um, making the closing statements, and he has to clean up from my mistake at the beginning where I forgot to put the thank you slide up. And so Fabian, are, are you uh, ready to roll on this? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, uh, I've pre I have uh, prepared a very, I mean, two, three slides just to, to thank you, to thank everyone. Uh, so the next one, um, uh, please, uh, Jennifer, if you can move the, the slide. Um, so first enough? of all, uh, um, really a big thank to the um, all the speakers uh, uh, and the panelists. The uh, presentations and discussions were were really. Um, uh, uh, exciting and high level. Uh, we really enjoyed it. So a, a big thank to everyone. Uh, the next one is um, if it can show up. Which slide do you want, yeah, Fabian? Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. So we, okay. with a, uh, th thank you on, on, on the uh, 
the sponsors and donors, so uh, uh, which are who are supporting the um, uh, ICHBV, um, and, and um, also the donors that are uh, uh, academic institutions. So a big thank for supporting ICE. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do uh, all these events. Uh, and uh, um, uh, drive the, uh, the the community for for towards this uh, uh, towards fo fostering the uh, all the different actions uh, regarding HPV cure, uh, and the next one, which will be the final one, is um, if yeah, is to to thank the uh, uh, governing board members of ISHBV. Um, uh, as well as um, uh, John uh, uh, and Ari uh, today for, for, for chairing the workshop and the, the governing board for, for uh, working group members for, for uh, coming up with this very nice uh, program, uh, as well as um, uh, Capucine and, and Jennifer who are, who are helping uh, in the management of ISHBB. Um, having said this, I, I, will, I will close and maybe uh, and, and, and over to you, uh, John, if you want to give the last, very last few words. Okay, so my last few words are thank, to, thank you to all uh, who have attended, including those who attended the uh, patient forum this morning. I also want to uh, give a heartfelt thanks to uh, Adam Gehring and Oriana Andrasani for organizing the main HPV meeting and of course the Hepatitis B Foundation folks for their continuing and superb support of the meeting and uh, thank you for your attention and the fine science that we uh, we were able to do together. Thank you.